begin, I'd like to uh, introduce you guys to the audience a little bit. So I'd like to ask, who all here is from the Harris School? You can raise your hand. So mostly policy kids. Uh, how many grad students do we have? And then undergrads? Okay, great. And then how many of you are from Illinois? Cool, all right. And so our first question today is gonna focus on Illinois government. And I'm, I'm curious as to why, what drew you to state government as opposed to local or national government? And maybe we'll start with really. State government is, to me, is the place where all the action happens. In, and they, it is indeed the laboratory of, of democracy, uh, and which makes it fun. And so you get to deal with a broad range of issues, uh, and uh, you don't have to sit in a box eight hours a day while you're running for office and do nothing but raise money. <laughs> you can actually get out and meet people and campaign and then, um, and then do your job as, as a legislator. And local government, for me, looked like the worst possible place to be of all the <laughs> Because in the suburbs, you know, it's a lot about zoning. It's a lot about, you know, is, is someone meeting your architectural standards? I don't mean to denigrate. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just how it was, you know, and like, I can't worry about neighbors whose fence doesn't the neighborhood don't like the, the other neighbor's fence. I, so local government, to me, um, looked, uh, just wasn't the place for that. Yeah. I, and I had heard that too, right? Um, folks who talked about the job of the aldermen in the city, you know, that's like picking up garbage and <laughs> that kind of thing. And uh, I, I'm much more interested in policy and the impact that we can have on policy. And in addition to that, um, when I first got involved in advocacy and organizing, it was around state issues. And so um, I think it was in 2010, um, I got involved in the effort to pass the uh, Illinois Voting Rights Act, and then the year after I worked on redistricting um, and uh, advocated for uh, state district boundaries, especially around the district that I now represent. Right? Um, there were really good reasons to change those boundaries so that the um, Chinese immigrant population could all be in a single district and have more voting power and representation. Um, and so, you know, th those experiences, um, and then also advocating for the um, Asian American Employment Plan the year after, um, you know, that all informed, you know, my uh, experience and, and really got me more interested in in uh, state level politics. And then also working for former Governor Quinn kind of cemented that. Um, got to see things from the inside and discovered that I really liked it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think just to echo what these two have already said, I mean, if you, if you love public policy, state government is, if you love public policy, you're not a billionaire who can buy himself a seat in Congress. Uh, state government is the place to be because, um, you know, you get to roll up your sleeves and get involved in a lot of really substantive, I mean, we have a, you know, $40 billion discretionary budget in the state. Like, we have, there's a lot that the state uh, can do to make enormous changes in people's lives. And at the same time, you know, our districts are small enough that uh, you don't have to campaign uh, through the sort of, like, media blitz millions of dollars on television. Like, the, you know, in my elections, competitive, contested elections, 9,000 people voted. So, you know, if I need 5,000 voters to win and I have six months, I can just spend every day knocking on people's doors and talking to people and sort of talk to a lot of those people over the course of that amount of time, right? Um, so you can win these elections uh, without having to have enormous financial support if you have a good sort of grassroots organization. So it makes it accessible for regular people. Uh, and then once you're in there, you really can deal with some pretty substantive and important issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what do you think makes the state of Illinois unique among the states? Well, um, oh, so much. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we can narrow it down a little bit. Yeah. We're going to focus on kind of the government in Springfield. Yeah. So the Illinois government, how Springfield works, as opposed to regionally Indiana or you know nationally. Sure, yeah. I mean, I guess I don't know too much about the inner workings of, the, of other state governments, 
but things that are um, unusual about mm -hmm. Illinois, um, at least as far as I can tell. I mean, first of all, you know, we're just coming off this two and a half years of not having a budget, right? Which was the longest any state had gone with that. I mean, like, that was, that was a very unique circumstance. And for me, that was right when I got elected. So I got elected in 2014. I started in 2015, right when Bruce Rounder started. And so the whole, my whole first two and a half years was all budget crisis. Um, so like, I'm hoping, I know, I know. I'm hoping someday to see what functional government looks like. Um, I don't know yet, I'll, I'll get back to you about that. Um, but I think that speaks to, um, that speaks to some sort of deeper facts about, uh, about Illinois, things that are unusual about Illinois. And I guess the one that I'll highlight for the moment, uh, and this is maybe not the direction you were hoping I would go with this question, but too bad, I'm gonna <laughs> get on my soapbox. Um, Illinois' tax structure is very unusual. Uh, most, some states don't have an income tax, but almost every state that has an income tax has a graduated income tax, where there's tax brackets, just like at the federal government, and higher earners pay higher rates. Um, and so when you're in a time of fiscal crisis, one of the tools that those states have in their tool belt <coughs> is to raise taxes on very wealthy people, right? Uh, especially at a time right now when most of the wealth is going to very wealthy people. We're gonna ask those folks to contribute a little more to help plug the budget hole, right? Um, we didn't have that available to us for the last two and a half years in Illinois because our state constitution requires a flat income tax rate. So everybody pays the same rate, which means if you wanna raise taxes on anyone, you have to raise them on everyone. And that makes it very politically unpalatable for a lot of members because it means they're not, they're not just raising taxes on the five richest people in their district, they're raising taxes on all 110,000 people they represent. Um, so that idiosyncrasy of the Illinois Constitution uh, has really hamstrung our ability to make meaningful policy and to operate in a fiscally responsible way as a state. So uh, it's, yeah, it's unique and it's really a problem as far as I'm concerned. And to that point, how many of us are studying municipal finance? Okay, so that's a little encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I think one of the things that makes, as I would say, it's always harder in Illinois. <laughs> uh, and I think one of the reasons that happens is because we are, and, and it, it does impact our ability to govern, is just the geographic size of Illinois. That we range from Richmond, Virginia on the south to Wisconsin, the board, you know, on the north. And, and the historic patterns of immigration to <coughs> Illinois uh, it, the, everything below I-80 is in fact populated who pe with people who came from the south, and everything from the north are, is populated from people who came from the northeast. Not everybody, but that's kind of the hist and and those patterns, those historic that historic uh, fact, still informs our politics in a in a very significant way, uh, and um, and so the the you know, I thought. I had worked for a state legislator before I got to before I got to the legislature. I thought I was pretty well prepared for how different um, the downstate legislators thought than the than the upstate legislators, and I was not prepared at all. And and so we have a lot of um, we have a lot of difficulty in governing because of that those that those completely different mindsets of the southern part of our state versus the northern part of our state, and I. You know, I mean, California is great big and it's got pockets of things, but it doesn't have that sort of historic immigration that informs its politics in the way that <clears throat> Illinois does. I think that makes it a difficult and, and, and makes us unique. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna say um, Illinois has its own particular brand of machine politics, right? I mean, machine politics is not unique to Illinois, but it has its own brand of you know the patronage patronage system and the you know families and you know folks who have been around for um, generations kind of holding on to power and um, you know the the kind of system that allows for Illinois to be the butt of jokes having sent I can't remember how many governors to, <laughs> to prison and, <laughs> um, and that sort of thing. So um, I would say that uh, there is a uniqueness there that 
you know, if you want to enter into politics, you kind of have to learn all about it and figure out how to um, get around it. Yeah, I mean, each of us in our own way has grappled with the political, democratic political establishment uh, in the course of our careers and uh, got the scars to prove it, don't we? <laughs> Which, exactly, in front of a room of grad students, begs the question, how did you how did you how did you manage establishment politics and progressive principles? Um, well, you know, I, I think I took an unusual route because um, I started my career in academia right here at the U of C, right? And I had no idea that I would end up running for office and um, being in a race where I ran against the son of a 20-year incumbent and in a district that included um, the 11th Ward, the Daily Machine, um, and being able to beat that system. But I think that, um, you know, to get from point A to point B, um, you know, that is like a U of C PhD student to, you know, nobody, nobody sent mm -hmm. and feeding the machine, you have to like, you know, get good at playing the game. You have to learn all about it and, um, you know, sort of understand politics as a game where you know what the rules are and you know who you need to talk to and what coalitions to build and, um, you know, how to come up with a strategy to, to win. And, you know, it's not easy. So just a quick follow-up to that. Do you ever worry that learning how to play the game and playing it well ends up replicating the game that you don't necessarily want to be played? No, because I think that it is it becomes possible to play it differently, yeah. right? So the alliances that I've built and that Will has built and Elaine has built, I think allows us to, you know, build up our power for good. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we try to get reelected so we can accomplish things that we believe in, that we can um, engage people, be more inclusive, you know, be progressive, mm -hmm. right? But, um, you know, you can't discount the need to raise money and mm -hmm. recruit volunteers and do all the things you need to do to stay in office because, you know, if you're not in office, you can't accomplish any of those things. I think one of the biggest tensions as someone who, you know, like Teresa, got elected challenging the political establishment and uh, with building sort of an independent base of grassroots power and organizing in my community. Um, one of the biggest tensions, especially coming from that kind of work, is this precise pull between um, working within the established system to get things done that are important to your community and standing up to that system when you think it's being unjust, right? Um, and I think that's just, that's a constant, there's no like hard and fast rule. And I think there are some people who take the hard and fast way in either direction, and I think it's wrong either way, in my opinion, right? Like there are people who are just like, I am never gonna give one ounce of compromise to this corrupt and broken system. And those folks just don't accomplish anything for the people who sent them to represent them, right? And so that's, I think that's a disservice to your community. But then on the other end, I think there's also the risk that you're talking about of saying, listen, I, you know, I'm here, I gotta play the game, I'm gonna, you know, I'm just gonna go along, get along, not, not ruffle any feathers, uh, and try to get, make things happen from the inside. Uh, and then you risk, I think, just sort of uh, ceding your power to the establishment, right? So um, navigating that tension and sort of uh, finding your way through the push and pull of those opposing forces, that's like a, constant, a constant struggle and an important one. I think if you're not conscious of that, you might accidentally fall into one side or the other. Um, so I think, you know, for me, I, I find myself being confronted with that challenge all the time in all manner of decisions and trying to figure out the right way through. My experience is a little bit different because I don't, as a, as a suburbanite, I don't face the, the challenges of the machine in the city. I, I was the first Democrat elected from Northbrook to the legislature ever. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, it was not, it wasn't a question of, of how to maneuver within the existing machine to get elected. So my talent, I never had to think about that, frankly. My, my focus was always on how do I deal with the machine politics of Springfield, mm -hmm. um, and that's primarily the speaker in, in my world. I'm going to speak for these folks. But, uh, and um, 
and I took him on in a, in, in a very direct way. Um, it's almost eight years ago now. He, he really requires two things, one, that you vote for him for speaker, and two, that you vote for his rules. And I got a burr in my saddle about the rules. <laughs> uh, and, um, and so I did a lot of homework and figured out like how I would change them and presented it to, to him. And, um, <clears throat> And we had a very lengthy conversation about it. <laughs> and I, and at one point, I, I was, we were down on the 13th board, and I finally I said, Speaker, you, you don't need my vote. I was like the 67th vote, you needed 60 votes to pass things. I said, what if I just voted no? And I had no, I just was not, I had no idea what to expect out of him. And he said, I think that would be OK. And I almost <laughs> fell out of my chair. <laughs> So I ended up voting no against rules, uh, and people th and I the, there was there wasn't much uh, about it except that that the, some of the insiders were like oh, oh there's Nackerts has just lost her chairmanship she's lost she's never going to get another bill passed you know she's going to lose her parking space outside the Capitol <laughs> and all, all these bad consequences and then nothing happened to me um, and uh, and um, and in fact I became an assistant majority leader the next term. Uh, so, so there are ways to do that, um, but you have to know the players. You have to understand, you know, what's what's going to um, help them. Uh, and um, and you pick your battles, you right? I mean, you pick your battles. Right. You definitely pick your battles, right? Yeah, you're not just like, you know, constantly, constantly raging fighting. against right. it, right? You, the things that are important to you, you stand up for, yeah. and you make it clear like where you're willing to be cooperative and work with folks, and where you're willing to draw the line, right. and. Uh, I think, you know, if you can make yourself understood that way. Right. So we're joined by some folks from uh, Women in Public Policy, which is a big student organization in Paris. And I'd kind of like to ask Teresa and Elaine to share your experiences uh, in politics, and specifically in Springfield. We've heard a lot about Springfield culture this summer, uh, which is awful tragic. But could you share, you know, your thoughts on what the culture has been for you, but then also what institutions could change? Institutions. What could you do to prevent oh, this sort of behavior okay. in danger? Okay. I think you should ask Will the question too. I. Okay. Um, I, 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 I was oblivious, frankly, <laughs> and, and I, and I, um, so because I never, I never experienced what I thought was um, uh, any sort, any sort of sexual harassment. Um, you know, I, I just, and to the extent that I was propositioned or whatever, I just like, no way, you know, we just <laughs> walk away. So I never felt, and, but I also came in a position of power. I came in as a legislator, not a staffer, not a lobbyist, where I was, you know, asking for, for votes and that kind of thing. So it's a, I, had a, I think I had a very different kind of dynamic, mm -hmm. um, both being naive and oblivious and from coming from a position of power. Um, mm -hmm. um, I did spend some time in Springfield as an advocate, um, and um, you know, so I mean, I have also been propositioned, and you know, kind of experienced some, you know, kind of gross behavior. Um, but um, it was after a a bill that I was working on had passed, and. Um, so I didn't feel like anything was being held over me, like, you know, do this or, or I'm not going to support your bill. Um, and it happened to be with, you know, one of the co-sponsors, you know, and it was um, in the context of, oh, let's go out and celebrate and, you know, oh, you know, we should, you know, work on stuff more often and, you know, kind of suggestive gross, you know, kind of uh, invitations to like, you know, go up to his room or whatever. Um, you know, so, so there is that kind of, you know, unwanted, you know, sort of assumptions that like, you know, anything goes in Springfield and that, um, you know, people would be open to this. And so, you know, there's, um, a prevalence of you know those kinds of propositions or you know assumptions about you know what people are willing to do and um, um, 
and I think that you know many people do find themselves in a situation where you know you can't really say anything about it you, you know brush it off or whatever in this case you know I mean I it wasn't anything that I could report or you know felt like um, I could do anything about um, but it was also very clear that it's like routine behavior from this particular person mm -hmm. and um, who's so hmm? who's still office? no okay. no so um, somebody who um, is a former representative and um, you know the, I think that that kind of behavior is is pretty prevalent if you're a woman um, in uh, you know with a lot less power than the person who's you know, behaving that way, then you're extremely vul vulnerable, especially if you have to continue to work in that environment, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, coming into my job now, um, it is different because, you know, I do have a little more power now, and um, um, but it is also a very male-dominated environment, right? And um, you know, and, and as a woman and a person of color, you know, I'm always very conscious of, you know, the demographic makeup of any room. Um, and in Springfield, you know, you do notice there are a lot more male lobbyists, um, you know, and then, you know, on one side of the aisle, you know, it's a lot less diverse than our side. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Not even any names, right? <laughs> um, but I think that the way it changes, you know, if we get more women in positions of power, you know, elected to um, the General Assembly and, you know, in um, positions in government, you know, in, in the governor's office and different places um, around Springfield so that the numbers change, right? So I think that that is one way. I mean, there are lots of different things that can be done or should be done, um, but I think that's the first thing that probably the easiest thing. I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, anyone you talk to who spent time in Springfield would tell you, oh, it's gross down there. That's oh, really the color. It's just a gross, slimy place. Right? It's just like a, one of those things that people say about Springfield. Um, and people sort of roll their eyes and laugh it off. Um, I, I think what's happening now is maybe people taking a closer look at what that actually means and how that affects people's lives. Um, and I'll say that like, um, the, some of the people I socialize with in Springfield are um, younger staff and lobbyists. Uh, like those are some of the folks I like go out with in Springfield. Um, and yeah, boy, you can see the difference in power dynamics so starkly. Um, and you see, you know, legislators putting their arms around young women lobbyists or putting their hand on their leg or whatever it is. And it's just like the position that we as men are putting these women in is just, it's just unacceptable, right? Because they're forced to make this choice of like, do I say something? say, I'm sorry, that's inappropriate, and jeopardize the relationship with the person who I'm being paid to have a relationship with, right, as a lobbyist, like, it's my job to be on good paper with all these people and have them listen to me and want to work with me. So do I jeopardize that, or do I allow my bodily autonomy to be violated by somebody in a way I don't want, right? And what I'm just a disgusting set of choices that we put before people. Um, and you know, all three of us are, uh, have done work in criminal justice reform. And one of the things that they say about uh, the effectiveness of punishment, right? The two, the two things that you have to do to make punishment effective is not about how long you sentence people for. Swiftness and certainty, right? That's what they say. So um, I think that, that that's how we're going to change the culture in Springfield, too. When people know that if they act like this, uh, if they act inappropriately toward women in that building, there is, they are for sure going to face consequences, and those consequences are going to come to them swiftly, right? Uh, I think that for certainly my entire time in Springfield, I suspect much, much longer than that, um, people have felt like they've got carte blanche when it comes to this stuff. Like, it's, nothing's going to happen to you 
right? So if people will, like, I, I think, I hope that the outcome of what's happening in Springfield now and around the country with this Me Too stuff is that men understand that there are consequences to these actions, that those consequences are going to happen to you and they're going to happen fast, and they're going to, in, in our world, like, they're going to end your career. Doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, doesn't matter if you're old or young, right? When you do this kind of stuff, it's going to happen, it's going to happen fast, and it's going to happen hard. And I think that's, uh, I think we're coming toward that, and I think that that is the one thing that's going to really uh, create cultural change. We had this, the, in that meeting we had the other day, uh, this uh, task force around sexual harassment, um, one of the folks who presented said, um, we may not, it's going to take us a while to change people's attitudes, but what we need to do right now is change people's behavior, right? Like, we may not turn all men in Springfield into enlightened feminists, um, but for the, like, let's just make them think twice about putting their hand on someone's throat, right? Like, let's just make them pump the brakes before they do that stuff. And we'll work on the attitudes in the long term, but let's start by going after the behavior. I have to think, though, if you're one of those legislators mm -hmm. that harassed or, you know, or, or inappropriately touched someone, you gotta be quaking in your boots right now. Yeah. You know, you gotta be thinking, my, my career could be ended, I, I'm gonna be very publicly shamed, my name's gonna be all over the newspaper as one of these horrible people because I'm a public figure. Right. I have to think that that alone is gonna tamp down right now. I mean, I, you know, it, I think you're right, if, if ultimately nothing happens to anybody, then people will forget and return to their normal, their normal behaviors. Right. But if, you know, I mean, the John Conyers resigning, and mm -hmm. you know, there's if there if a few suffer some consequences, yeah. boy, I, it just that's a very public shaming to have your name splattered all over the newspaper for that. Twenty some senator senators, Democrats called on Al Franken to yeah, resign. To resign yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, he speaks to our audience. That's right. He's got a that's interesting press conference. Hmm. Immigrant communities historically underrepresented in politics uh, as voters and as leaders. How do you think about engaging the different immigrant communities, both in Chicago, but then also Illinois wide, uh, and bring them into the process? And Teresa, I'll start with you. Well, I, uh, that's, that's very important to me. And um, um, during my campaign, um, I made sure to um, train and include um, you know, young people, um, immigrants in particular, uh, you know, we had to run a campaign in three languages, right, because my district includes, um, it's a predominantly immigrant population, but um, I have Spanish-speaking uh, constituents and Chinese-speaking constituents, and so, you know, I knew I, I, in order to be truly inclusive, I had to reach out to people in the language in which they're most comfortable. And uh, so, you know, I hired um, organizers, you know, field organizers who were bilingual in Spanish and English, Chinese and English, and in, in one case, you know, three dialects of Chinese mm -hmm. and English, right? And, um, um, you know, really did everything I could to, to reach out to people, you know, with, an understanding that a lot of folks are new to politics and um, you know needed to be uh, reached out to and uh, and included. So you know in the, in the end, ultimately, um, you know there was much higher voter turnout uh, last year. You know in in almost all the races, but um, I was able to. Um, quintuple the Asian American turnout in my district. That was one of the ways that I won. Um, but in order to, to get there, you know, we had to, you know, reach out to people in their in their um, language, um, you know, send out mailers, you know, that were bilingual. You know, I had to go to uh, community events, you know, so, so I went out to, um, you know, all kinds of community <coughs> events in my district and you know, spoke to people about my experience um, as a child of an immigrant, right? That was something that, you know, whether I was talking to um, Latino voters or Asian American voters in my district, um, you know, it didn't make sense to um, 
you know, divide up that population, you know, I talked about what um, they had in common and, and my experience as a child of an immigrant and the need to give voice to their issues and, um, and my understanding of um, their experiences. And I think that that went a long way in engaging people and um, encouraging them to uh, support me. But that, that was also um, after many years of legwork leading up to that. You know, I had been involved in um, voter engagement efforts, you know, where we registered voters and, and turned out voters and educated them on, on various candidates. So I did that, um, you know, for non nonpartisan um, organizations, right? But this was, you know, in the, in the years leading up to my campaign. And, you know, there are continuing um, efforts along those lines, you know, organizations that are nonpartisan but, you know, really focus on voter engagement, registering voters, um, getting them out to vote. Um, and um, I think that those are really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's a point that I really wanted to make, which is that uh, the work has to happen outside of election time. I think that's the most important thing. Like, as I represent a district on the northwest side of Chicago, that has a pretty high immigrant population also. And during elections, particularly when you're running as an outsider, it, they're, uh, it's sort of like a resource management game, right? Like you have limited resources compared to your opponent with lots of resources, so how can you deploy your resources the most effectively? Um, and the way you do that is by going after people who vote, right? Like the effort that it takes to get someone who's a very ir infrequent voter to the polls versus the effort it takes to get to persuade a very frequent voter just to vote for you, it's much easier, right? You're spending a lot less resources to persuade the frequent voters rather than talking to the infrequent voters and saying, okay, first of all, here's where you vote, here's how you vote, and here's what voting is about. And then also, by the way, I'm a good person you should vote for, right? That's like, there's a lot of energy required there. Um, so uh, the way to get campaigns to care about immigrant communities is to get immigrant communities voting, right? Because once you're a regular voter, one of those things about voting is that if you're not in the habit of it, it's very unlikely you're gonna do it. And if you are in the habit of it, it's very likely that you're gonna do it. So if you can get immigrant communities registered to vote and voting and engaged politically in the off season, then when it comes time for candidates to wanna to run for office, they're gonna say, oh, these folks are regular voters. They're gonna be easy folks for me to persuade. So I'm gonna go target my attention and my messaging and my interest to them, right? So that makes that population much more sort of uh, lucrative from a political perspective for candidates. So uh, if you're interested in doing that kind of organizing work, like it's got to be, it can't just be around election time, okay, we got to get these people to vote. It's got to be how do we build a sort of habit of voting and political engagement within immigrant communities. So everybody thinks the communities I come from are completely white bread. They are not. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are large immigrant populations. Actually, a lot of immigrants are coming to the country and moving directly to the suburbs rather than stopping in the city in the neighborhoods that, that Will and Teresa represent before coming to the suburbs. So it is an issue that, um, that I fought long and hard about because I have the same questions. I've got, well, those are voters that I would like to have vote for me. How do I engage with the immigrant communities? Um, but I would state, start with Teresa's point of quintupling the Asian American vote. That didn't just happen, that would not have happened if Will Gazzardi were running in Teresa's district. It happened because you're Chinese American um, and, 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 mode, and excited the Asian community and, and got them out. So I'd say first and foremost, you've got to have a diversity of candidates. And, and in the suburbs, there's, I don't know, I feel like there's more opportunities to do that, to get the immigrants' communities involved in park boards, library boards, village boards, boards and commit, you know, the volunteer boards and commissions and all the manner of things. And we um, have tried really hard to do that and we've had some success, actually. We have our first um, Asian American on the Northbrook Village Board, um, which we're very excited about, but we have um, other um, folks populating uh, the other boards and commissions that we're in. So I'd like to try to bring folks in to participate, to participate in government. And then I do think it is a question of um, engaging not only uh, engaging with the leaders in those communities and um, empowering them to do the work that they do to bring um, to, to educate uh, their communities on how important it is to, to 
to vote and to get to know the candidates and to support the right candidates. And, um, and, and I think both are, at least from a suburban perspective, are really important. Which is a great segue to the next question about the sorts of folks you guys see running for office these days. Traditionally, it's been lots of lawyers or folks that have worked in government in the past. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing organizers run, we're seeing business people run, we're seeing uh, people with academic backgrounds run. Do you, do you see that diversity happening around you? And, and what trajectory do you kind of see it going? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been very exciting. Um, uh, this year in particular, since so many of our colleagues are leaving the legislature, um, seats have opened up that no one thought would be open, you know, for a long time. And um, most of the candidates jumping in, I'm, I'm seeing a lot more women, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, but uh, yeah, a, a huge diversity of candidates. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've mostly paid attention to races in the Chicagoland area, so you know, I can't speak for town state or anything like that. <laughs> I don't know if things are changing all that much, you know, south of I eighty. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I've I've been really excited to. Um, to learn about some of the new candidates and and in a few cases you know really trying to do my best to mentor them and and you know it was really difficult to go through what I went through and I don't think that you really understand how difficult it is to run for office until you've done it yeah, yeah. and so there are a number of candidates in various races around the area that you know I'm trying to help as much as possible, you know, just being available to um, answer questions and, and to give tips and to, you know, make connections for them to make it a little bit easier <laughs> because, um, you know, it, it, was, it was pretty brutal. <laughs> so. I, mean, I think about uh, in Laura Fine's district, right, mm -hmm. there's what, uh, it's all women, it's I think, in that field. Four or five. One man. Okay, the, a field of lots of women. Anyway, yeah. the district right adjacent to mine, Cynthia Soto's former district. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's, I think, five women who are running for that seat. Um, so it's really it, that's really exciting. Certainly, um, I think like the the energy, particularly in Democratic Party politics right now, around lifting up the voices of women, mm -hmm. uh, just, it's very palpable. You see it in the election cycle right now. Um, uh, and in some of the congressional races too. Uh, um, I think that, uh, I mean, what Elaine said before is absolutely right, that um, we're gonna engage traditionally disenfranchised communities, immigrant communities, communities of color by, in, uh, by running a diverse slate of candidates, right? Um, but not only people who look like you, but also people who advocate for your community's interests, right? Mm -hmm. um, people who are talking about the issues that matter to your communities, right? Because uh, I, I think that sometimes we get caught up in, like we stop at identity, right? And we say, well, that's a, that's a black district and there's a black candidate running, so that person's gonna win, and that, that's, that's the person for that district, right? Um, but I think it's really important that, uh, I, I think often people, particularly in communities of color, I can speak only from the areas I represent, but I think that this is a phenomenon more broadly, um, feel frustrated by having representation that is nominally representing them, but not in fact, right? Not actually advocating for the interests of their communities, just part of the sort of political power structure and out there for their own interests. And the neighborhoods are being neglected just the same way that they were, right? Um, so I think it's important uh, not just to have like identity representation, but to have genuine sort of uh, uh, material, substantive representation also. Um, and I think we're seeing that more and more. I think, you know, we've had a lot of colleagues come in in the last couple of cycles who have been phenomenal advocates for their community. I mean, I think about like um, Sonia Harper and Letisa Wallace and Juliana Stratton yeah. spring to mind three black women who represent their communities just in extraordinary fashion and are really like genuine heartfelt advocates for the urgent needs that their communities are facing. Um, and I think that kind of representation is what inspires people to show up and vote because it's like that's, that's who I want, that's what I want out of government. Yeah. 
I think and I'm, I'm going to take just a little different tack, but just in terms of the backgrounds of mm -hmm. the folks that that are there. It used to be, I think, you know, a couple of decades ago, that legislation were highly populated with lawyers, mm -hmm. and I'm not quite sure why, other than I think that maybe it was the the ability uh, well, a lawyers tend to be interested in making laws, um, and it was a way for them to promote their legal practice. Uh, and, and, it, and it was also a job that where there was some flexibility um, to allow you to be at the Capitol for several for weeks on end, um, and you could still sort of manage your law practice that way. That is just not the case at all anymore. Uh, it is, we have a broad diversity of backgrounds, as you mentioned, you know, some of which you mentioned, but you know, we got farmers and insurance agents and pharmacists and dentists and I mean it is you know and academics and you know it, it, it runs the gamut so there there is no when I mean, people ask me oh what, what 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 should I go into in order to be a public official I don't care <laughs> go go do what you're interested in um, and if that you know leads you to public service great but there there is just no background and you know it's really hard to run for public office, and you just nothing you will do in your private life will prepare you <laughs> for, yeah. for the challenges that you're going to face when you when yeah. you put your name on the ballot. Yeah. Go fight a war, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Well, because yeah. you know volunteering in campaigns, and it's like being in the trenches. Right. And that's a really apt. You uh, think you know. You analogy. think you know. You think you know, and then oh. Wait. <laughs> we could all tell you some yeah. stories. Yeah. And these guys would have much worse stories than me. No, I know. So, what was the most surprising thing when you ran for office about being in the process? What did you, what the least, the thing you least expected? Oh, I least expected that I would lose 30 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> When I, when I finished my first, I ran in 2012 in the competitive race and lost and ran again in 2014 against the same incumbent and won. Um, at the end of my first race in 2012, uh, I went and visited my grandma, um, uh, my kindly southern grandma who was living at the time in Nashville. Uh, I went down and spent some time with her and when I got back to my apartment a couple of days later, I got a package from her of like protein shakes and supplements and all the vitamins and everything. She was like, you looked like hell. <laughs> it does take it out of here. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think for, for, for me, um, probably the most surprising thing was the, the, the experience of the doors. Mm -hmm. Just the breadth of responses you get that you would yeah. get um, and you know, I mean, I one of my one of my as I lost in my first campaign as well, and I remember going to this guy's door, and, and I said, I'm Elaine Neckerts, I'm the Democratic candidate for you're all socialists. <laughs> 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 I was just like, <laughs> and then you got to pick up and keep going to the next one and pretend like it never happened. Like, hi, I'm Elaine Neckerts. <laughs> so, but then um, the next one, they invite you into their living room, and you're sitting there yeah. for half an hour, and you're I mean, like. You yeah. get the whole range get of whole human range. experience. Yeah, of like coming to the door in their underwear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's I, just, yeah. yeah. I saw, only saw a gun one time. Uh, <laughs> but I knocked on somebody's, this was like 8.30, and when it's late at night, you get kind of frustrated, because you can see the lights that are on in people's yeah. houses, right? So I was like, okay, your lights are on, I know you're in there. Like, and I'm like, I'm trying to hit my numbers for the night by nine, so like, okay, so I knock on the door and nobody answers. Uh, I knock on the door again, I hear people shuffling around, I'm like, come on, bro, I know you're home. <laughs> so I knock really loudly one more time. And it was a door like this, and there's a little window over the top of the door, and the guy just raises his hand up here, holding a pistol like this. I was like, okay, no, nope, yeah, that's fine. Right. You can vote for whoever. <laughs> so I've never seen a gun, but just a couple weeks ago, one of my volunteers had a gun pulled on him. Oh, wow. Wow. Yep. Um, it's a wild but, out there, um, yeah. but you know, if any of you are thinking of running for <laughs> office, I mean, I would hope that you know you'd volunteer on a lot of campaigns, so you kind of have an idea of what to expect at the doors, and and you should learn whether you like knocking on doors, yeah. because you know, 
it's really hard to be a first time candidate if you've never been involved in politics, if you've never knocked on a door. Um, I mean, I think that that's probably one of the hardest things. And, and you know, you have to do it all the time. I mean, that's how you win. And if you don't like talking to people, mm -hmm. if you don't like knocking on doors, then yeah. it's not for you. Yeah. I, I will say, though, I, I, I hate knocking on doors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very introverted person. She can say this because she's retired. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta be like, we love everything. I love Hollywood. I really do love Hollywood. But I, I think, but for me, there was the equation of I could either lose and just get out of this, or I could do what I had to do and put up with it in order to be successful and go do the work that I love. Mm -hmm. And so for 15 years, nine elections, that equation worked for me. It's just, you know, now it just kind of, now it's not working for me anymore. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. But you don't have to, you don't have to be an extrovert, uh, you know, I love talking to people, I, you know, I, I can't wait to get to that. Yeah. Yeah, I, would, I, I don't think, think there's anyone who can be an extrovert 100%. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, mean, I would I, think of both of you as introverts yeah, naturally, yeah, probably. Right, yeah. yeah. And you're both excellent campaigners. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. Yeah. But, but you're right. I mean, I'm, I'm naturally yeah, an yeah. introvert. Yeah. And, you know, but I can turn it on. But right. it takes a lot out of you. And that's probably how I lost 30 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that's, that's, a, that's a huge piece of it is like, You've, you're on all the time. Okay. I mean, even being elected, uh, it's, I mean, to a certain extent, it's a little different, but, mm -hmm. but especially when you're campaigning, you just feel like you are on all the time. I'm a, you know, I do the Myers-Briggs, and I'm mostly in the middle, but the, I'm a big E, I'm a major mm -hmm. extrovert. And even for me, it's draining to be like, Wilk is already candidate all the time, <laughs> and like just constantly. Yeah. And uh, boy, I found it, I don't know about you guys, but I found it so rewarding during the campaign to be with friends from before. Oh, yeah. Just people you can just turn it off and be normal will with. Oh, God, that was like, I really, yeah. really yeah. needed that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then. Okay, now we've all exposed our personality. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but also, you know, after, after I won my primary and, you know, I didn't have to knock on doors for a little while, um, you know, you just turn off completely. I mean, you crave the silence. You, you know, you don't want to make another fundraising call. <laughs> oh, Lord, we didn't even talk about that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so that's another, you know, place where you have to talk to people and you have to ask for money, right? I mean, and, and, and that's really hard. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I didn't want to talk to anyone on the phone. I didn't want to, you know, yeah. I just had to kind of turn off, yeah. shut off and, and recharge. You know, yeah. Like have a silent retreat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What percentage of your days, and I guess like average over the year, right? What percentage of your life do you commit to <laughs> campaign mode as opposed to governance and governing? In terms of how you think about it, the time you spend on it, can it's, you just break down? It blends a little bit, I have to say. Like uh, when you're elected, you know, when I go. Uh, okay, so next week we're having a town hall meeting in my district. Um, it's not a campaign event. This is a you know an event where I'm talking to people about the base like state government 101. We're doing a presentation with folks about like how does this work? If you want to get involved in the process, how do you do it? That's not a campaign function, but it is in some ways campaign mode, right? I'm facing my constituents and showing them what kind of representative I am. Um, so the distinction between like campaign mode and governing mode is not quite as I mean in some ways it's like legally black and white, but in some ways it's really not at all. Um, uh, I mean, in terms of like explicitly campaign work, it's not that much of the time. Uh, I'm very lax about doing fundraising. <laughs> much, <laughs> much Especially to, if you're on a post. Yeah, right, I'm right. I'm, I don't have an opponent in this coming election, so I'm like not going to spend a lot of time doing explicitly campaign work. Um, but even when I'm doing organizing work around a legislative initiative, right? Like I'm traveling around the state talking about tuition-free Illinois, about making our public universities tuition-free. Like that's not campaign work, but it is a campaign. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's uh, mm -hmm. so all, even the policy stuff, even the really sort of nuts and boltsy policy stuff, often has a sort of campaign style affect mm -hmm. to it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know. 
good government is good politics, mm -hmm. and and yeah. and they overlap a lot. I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I probably if I left to my own devices, I never would have held a town hall meeting. But uh, but I had <laughs> um, because I, I felt that was good government. I needed to face my constituents, and 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 I needed to get known. And it's the power. It is in part the power of incumbency, mm -hmm. which is why incumbents win because they have. That constant opportunity to be in front of their constituents and and uh, and getting to and the mm -hmm. constituents getting to know them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's. It, it's really hard to um, disentangle yeah. um, our work because I mean, even when I had a town hall meeting, you know, I had to knock on doors to talk to constituents to let them know that I was sure. having a town hall meeting. You know, because you can. You can have a town hall meeting, <laughs> and you know nobody would show up right. or know about it. Town hall meeting happens in the woods. But you know you have to, you know, put it on Facebook. You have to knock on doors and talk to people. You have to reach out to groups of constituents to you know get them engaged. You know, so you have guaranteed attendance yeah. because yeah. it'd be really <clears throat> embarrassing and kind of a waste of time to plan. A whole town hall meeting and not have anybody show up and so you know there's a lot of political calculus to like almost every event that we put together you know my staff and I um, you know we try to distribute the location of the events in different neighborhoods in my district I have six neighborhoods that you know I overlap and um, you know we have to make sure that you know we're not favoring one over the other or um, you know or appearing to, you know, favor one population over the other, um, you know. So there are all kinds of calculations that we're making in our heads all the time. Mm -hmm. So I've got two more questions before we go to audience Q and A, and they're related. Uh, they're a little canned, but I hope you'll <laughs> let me get away with them. What? Uh, and this is going back to Illinois. What is the biggest challenge in the five-year term? In Springfield, <clears throat> what is the one issue that kind of keeps you up at night that you worry about? The budget, right? I don't know. For me, it's the budget. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, we, you know, we solved the budget crisis, right? We raised the income tax and uh, stabilized the state's fiscal situation, mm -hmm. but it's not done, and we're gonna. State budgets are bad all the way around, and if the federal government has their way, it's gonna get a lot worse. Mm -hmm. um, depending on what they do with Medicaid, is not, Medicaid is a huge portion of our state budget, and if the federal government decides to mess with that in any way, it's gonna be a huge problem for us. But even still, just revenues are worse than expected, uh, and a lot of expenditures are continuing to grow. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think that's, mm -hmm. we're not done, and the problem is, because we sorta of half-assed it, <laughs> uh, if I'm being candid, right, we solved the problem nominally but not in a really sustainable kind of way um, and the problem is it's going to make it really hard to go back to the taxpayers and ask for more mm -hmm. because we just i mean and people are getting bashed around the head for this tax increase right all around the state uh and governor rounder is going to run a year-long campaign about how terrible this tax increase was and i hope it fails but nonetheless like the appetite for legislators to go and raise taxes again in whatever way to fix the budget stuff is gonna be pretty limited. And that's a real problem because if we try to solve this thing with cuts and austerity, it's gonna really hurt a lot of people who need us, so. And from your perspective, the answer is the graded income tax? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of a long-term answer. Um, changing the Constitution. Uh, yes, changing the, changing the Illinois Constitution sadly <laughs> takes a little time. Um, uh, Elaine can tell you about retirement income. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I totally agree. I think it, it, it is it is the budget. Uh, what? And, and I would agree with Will. We did not. Um, we we solved it. Probably, you know. I mean, I, I don't. We need. We had to have Republican votes. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure we could have done much more mm -hmm. right. getting Republican votes than what than what we did. Um, but it is um, it is not a the kind of thing where we're out of the austerity situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, and. I agree with Will that the long-term solution is a progressive income tax, a longer-term solution is a progressive income tax, but boy, in the next three years, it's really gonna be, it's really gonna be hard, mm -hmm. if, 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 assuming you can get that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and we will need Republican votes to do that. At the moment, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I would agree with everything they said, and um, I guess I would add to that. I think that we have um, this challenge of trying to maintain our Democratic majority. Yeah. And I'm not saying that you know to be partisan, but just to get things done um, because we've seen that you know the Republicans you know I mean they would prefer austerity and they would prefer policies that are not good for our constituents. Mm -hmm. And so you know I think that um, going into 2021 when the map gets redrawn, I mean I think we need a Democratic governor and. Um, to maintain our majority so that, you know, we can get policies passed that, that you know, we think are helpful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But judging by your commitment to public service, uh, we can assume some level of optimism about the state. Not everything's going to hell, hopefully. <laughs> what, uh, what about Springfield or Illinois brings you the most hope? I think it's still pretty well, the, I, I, would, I have two responses to that. Mm -hmm. um, actually, three. Two of them are sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> that, that we have a great, I think we have a really great crop of, of um, legislators who uh, are committed to doing right by the state of Illinois um, and getting away from some of the old style politics mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, doing right by the people. And I, I, that gives me um, optimism. I also have optimism. The you know the, the the Chicago land area still has a very vibrant economy, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and we may have to drag the rest of the state kicking and screaming along with us. Um, but this is a this is a still a very strong um, region, and uh, and we it, and it has the the assets necessary to sustain that as long as we don't do more things to screw it up. <laughs> I, I would agree with the first part in particular that um, us. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Right? We're all right. okay. um, but but we are seeing more and more colleagues and, yeah, and uh, candidates, right? So you know there are a lot of really exciting races with um, you know progressive and you know more diverse um, candidates and. Uh, folks who are not adhering to, you know, old style establishment politics or machine politics, um, so so that gives me a lot of hope. I mean, I've been, um, like like I said before, excited about quite a few of the races, and um, you know, uh, watching it very closely, you know, because it's like sports <laughs> to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I'm, I mean, for me, it's similar. It's, I feel like there's a real groundswell happening. I think there's a movement building in the city and around the state, and I think it's incredibly powerful. Um, and uh, I think it's going to really uh, bring about tremendous political change in Illinois. I think more and more people, irrespective of party, are looking at government and seeing the folks in charge serving their own interests and the interests of their friends and their allies and their donors and turning their back on the interests of our communities, and people are just done with it. Um, and I think that more and more candidates are running for office who are saying it ought not be that way, that we ought to have an actual representative government that represents our interests, that fights for the things we care about, that protects our communities, that stands up for our values. Mm -hmm. And people are excited about it. People are getting engaged in politics in a way they haven't been in a long time. Uh, I look at my generation, my peers, and see so many people who are, I mean, you know, you guys are in this room, I would imagine because you feel the same way. That it's like this is a moment in our nation's history where like things are at a turning point, and we want to engage and we want to be a part of this and turn things in the direction that we believe in, right? And so I think there's this a real groundswell happening, and it's going to change the way Illinois politics looks. Uh, it's going to change the interests that Illinois politics serves, and within our own party, you know, I mean, we're we're all of us, you know, all three of us, and many others in our party feel like the Democratic Party in the state hasn't stood up for what Democrats are supposed to stand up for, and that we need to elect better Democrats who are actually fighting for the needs of our communities. And, and that, um, that sentiment is real and powerful and growing. I think more and more people are going to get elected 
on those values and more and more people are gonna look to change the institution with that perspective, I think that, that makes me very hopeful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'd like to open up the audience questions. Loren? Hi there. Hi, thank you for being here. Uh, so, Will, you talked a little bit about representatives who represent their constituents nominally, mm -hmm. and I was curious about what the two of you currently and Elaine previously um, have to say about what you do and what you <coughs> recommend that future policy makers that may be representing nominally do to really find out what is important to their constituents and what you think the drivers are when you see people representing nominally and not necessarily materially for their uh, yeah, I think it's just, um, it's about not thinking that you know what's right for people, right? Um, I mean, I represent a majority Latino district, um, and uh, I, you know, I'm not going to make assumptions about what I think my community wants or needs, right? Uh, I think the best form of governance, and a form of governance that we're capable of because our districts are small enough, you know, is really... Uh, involves mutual accountability, right? That the people who organized and who we, we worked to organize to get me elected, we didn't just say, okay, see you later, right? We're continuing to work with those folks and bring those folks together and have conversations and dialogue with those folks about, okay, now that I'm in office, what does our community need? What are, the, what are the biggest concerns that are facing our neighborhoods? And how can I work with you? And those folks are holding me accountable, right? They're saying, you ran for office saying A, B, and C, what are you doing about it, right? And so I'm meeting with our leaders and having these conversations. And, and I think that, uh, that sort of um, bilateral kind of relationship is what it takes to have like meaningful uh, representation. And it, it, in, it requires engagement from both sides, right? It, it requires constituents who are willing to you know, show up and hold me accountable, but it also requires me to enter into that relationship with folks. Uh, and I think that how you get elected has a lot to do with how you, whether or not you enter in those kinds of relationships, right? Like if you get elected because you're anointed by the political establishment, then you don't really feel, you don't have the relationship in the first place and you don't really feel the need to enter into that kind of relationship. But when you get elected through a sort of grassroots organizing kind of campaign, mm -hmm. that you, you have the relationships with the folks in your community and you feel that that's who you're beholden to. Thank you. I, I would just build on that a little bit that it, it requires folks to, voters to really um, engage on who's running for office mm -hmm. because you I think if you really get to know that person um, and again I think it's doable at this level of government and it's really important to do at this level of government you can tell where that person is self-motivated or motivated because they want to do the job on behalf of the district and and mm -hmm. distinct you know and making sure that the right candidates run and are elected um, is really where it, it all starts because once they're in office if they're if they're going to be there, you know, on the Ube Est Mia, where is mine um, platform, it, it, you know, there's very little you can do about it at that point. Mm -hmm. It's really got to happen on the re candidate recruitment and electing the right candidate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that, that means, um, you know, doing your research and getting to know the candidates, you know, beyond what gets mailed to your mailbox, because, you know, that's going to be a very skewed representation of, of the candidates, right? You have to be really engaged and, you know, show up at the candidates' forums and, you know, read um, the various endorsements from, you know, different kinds of publications and, you know, talk to, talk to people who, um, you know, uh, would be able to, to share with you, you know, what the candidate's really about. If, you know, that is if you don't get a chance to talk to all the candidates. In the back. Uh, hey, my name is Garau. I was wondering if you guys could talk about uh, some of the campaigns that you, uh, some of the unsuccessful campaigns that you've run and how you bounce back and you know, target the same constituents. Mm -hmm. Teresa? Yeah, so um, <coughs> I, I moved back to Illinois in 2006, and um, that was when um, I began to really engage in Illinois politics. I mean, before I was grad student at the UC and you know I 
didn't really leave Hyde Park very much. <laughs> <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but when I came back and um, and I was working here on campus, actually, I was at the at the race center. Um, I was teaching and doing administrative work at the race center, and it wasn't a tenure track position, and so that freed me up to. Uh, you know, focus less on research and publication, which freed up a lot of time, actually. And so I got involved in Tammy Duckworth's campaign for Congress in 2006. Um, and, you know, she lost by like one <coughs> or two percentage points, right? So that was really uh, disappointing, but um, it was, it hooked me. Right. I, so the next year I got involved in an aldermanic campaign. I uh, wanted to help Macy Dolar become the first Asian American woman in the city council. And um, in the 50th ward. 50th ward, right. So West Rogers Park, even though I worked in Hyde Park and sometimes I was so committed that I would drive up to West Rogers Park for campaign meetings, you know, an hour and a half in, in rush hour. Right. You know, I did that a few times, and I knocked on doors, and you know, like you know, did a lot of work for that campaign. She lost by 600 votes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, and then you know, so I was involved in a slew of losing campaigns. <laughs> you know, but this is you know how you learn. Um, that I then got involved in uh, Mark Perez's race for um, third, the third congressional district. He was running against Dan Lipinski. Um, and that was, you know, a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's really a miracle you're here. Yeah, really. <laughs> no, but I, I, I really think that you know I, I learned so much, right? You know, with the traditional campaign, and you know, for for the Lipinski, uh, the the Mark Perez campaign against Lipinski. I mean, I volunteered in um, my uh, precinct which at the time was part of the 11th Ward. So, you know, I stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the precinct captains, you know, at the polling place. <laughs> and, you know, and I was like fresh and full of enthusiasm. You know, I didn't you know, really know how things worked. And, you know, so I was like passing out my palm cards on election day, you know, running all over the place trying to, you know, hand palm card to, you know, whoever was going to the door. And there's like these, like, Prison captains who've been at it since they're like teenagers or whatever. These like big, you know, city worker type guys. Sorry, um, but uh, <laughs> that's real. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so I was kind of naive, but I also learned that you know it's not so bad to be in that environment. To you know, you could stand toe to toe with those guys, and you know, you don't have to be afraid. Do you think the naivete helped you? Yeah, I think so. At, at that point. Yes. I mean, you quickly lose it. Yeah. <laughs> the more losing campaign. <laughs> you know, but then after that, um, oh, and then I did a, um, a countywide uh, judicial, like the circuit court um, race for uh, one of my friends, who and, and we lost. But I learned a lot about um, running a candidate countywide and learned that I would never want to do that myself. <laughs> Um, uh, but then after that, it was you know Barack Obama and you know um, lots of other winning candidates. Um, so you know, uh, but but you know more losing candidates than winning candidates. And and I think after a certain point, you learn how to figure out who's going to win and or who has more of a chance of winning. You know, so I think right now after ten years, I'm really good at handicapping. Political yeah. racist. But what's your personal uh, mm -hmm. win win rate? Campaigns that you have run, where you've been in your name on the ballot. Oh. You're batting a thousand, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the best batting average uh, up here. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah. Yes. So I. I, I ran, um, yeah. So, so congratulations. Yeah. Um, <laughs> As the guy with the worst batting average up here. Uh, but you've been an inspiration. I mean, I think a lot of the people who are running now, I mean, they look to your race because I think that was a watershed moment when, I mean, you had to do it twice, and it was really heartbreaking the first time. 
<laughs> it was hard. Yeah, that's so the first time I ran in 2012. Uh, I was 24 years old. I uh, quit my job making $10 an hour doing online news to run for office. Uh, and um, yeah, we lost by 125 votes. We uh, got like 49.2% of the vote. Um, yes, it was very, it was very hard. Um, Will wasn't just running against the machine, he was running against the daughter of the Cook County Democratic Party chairman. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is true. Um, and, and the first time they didn't really take me that seriously, uh, because who was I as a 24-year-old kid from nowhere? But uh, the second time I ran against the same person and they really they saw me coming and really uh, <laughs> turned on the, I don't know, the fire hose of money and uh, attack ads and everything. Um, but uh, I mean, I think you learn so much from running and losing. No offense. Uh, uh, <laughs> you, you learn so much from running and losing. Um, and like Teresa said before, like there's, some things about running for office that you just only find out from doing it. That you could volunteer on a million campaigns, and then when you when it's your name on the ballot, it's just a totally different experience. Um, and when you run and lose, uh, you get real clarity over the course of that campaign about like what worked. Um, and when we ran this, when I ran the second time around, we built like. You know, the fundamentals of the campaign are the same. The fundamentals of every campaign, at least at our level, every campaign are the same. You've got to raise enough money to be able to communicate with voters through mass media, particularly through the mail, and then you just got to spend a lot of time yourself and your volunteers face-to-face, door-to-door, talking to people. You set your goals, and you run your numbers, and you figure out how many votes you need and where you're going to get them, and you just go do it. Um, but the, the, the tactics of how you implement that and how you build out a program, like what, what kind of message do you want to tell people through the mail? And like, how do you want to make sure that your volunteers have a good experience in the office, like come back another time, right? And, um, and how do you communicate with your voters who you've already spoken to, right? Like we, you know, we came up with this very cute program of mailing people little postcards, wishing them happy holidays, uh, reminding them that they promised to vote for me, right? So if I, <laughs> if I like knocked on your door in October, you got a little Christmas card from me saying, happy holidays from Will already looking forward to you getting out there and voting for me I'm in March. You know? like, with those little sort of tactical things that you pick up over the course of having done it once before, uh, and just, it, it hones your ability to do it effectively. Um, and you develop credibility with your, with your electorate. Like, you know, when I knocked on somebody's door, in 2014, the second time I was running, I'm like, yeah, well, we remember you. You were here three times in 2012. Uh, we voted for you then, and we're still with you now. You know, like, we've seen you doing this work. Like, you just build uh, rapport with your constituents. Like, it was really meaningful and valuable. So, did you know as soon as you lost the campaign that you were going to come back in 2014? Or did it take some I did it. Uh, it took me probably six months to know for sure that I wanted to do it again. I mean, I knew I wanted to stay engaged in political organizing stuff. But I had to sort of, first we had to do a recount because it was that close, so like there was that, and then I just like needed some time to uh, get my head screwed on straight. But yeah, um, pretty soon we sort of, we sort of saw it coming. I think we have time for one more question, Sandy. Sid? Thank you very much. Um, so you said one more question, so I'll uh, Actually, I have three, but I'll just have one. <laughs> <laughs> What's your most briefest and most concise? <laughs> I'm sorry? No. <laughs> okay. um, so my question is, I mean, I guess this really comes back to uh, an example I just gave about um, politics and incentives. Um, it's, it's called analytical politics. But uh, my question is, at any point in your careers as legislators, did you ever feel that your incentives as legislators clash with your incentives as policymakers, which is why I assume you mm -hmm. ran for office in the first place? I don't think so. No, um, my my um, you know that, that political tensions for sure, and you know, like, and mostly on issues that were not important to my district, so I didn't have a strong sense of where the, the way I ought to be voting, and so I was worried. You know, I mean, the charter schools is a perfect is the best example I can come up with. There's no charter schools in my district. There's no one looking to order open a charter school in my district. So I don't, I don't really care, but 
but the you know the, the unions matter a lot to me and then the charter school people had you know were writing huge campaign donation checks and so I was trying to when I didn't when, when I didn't have my own like my own policy guide and my district didn't have its own needs how do I weigh those things and those kinds of things made me crazier than um, than um, than anything I can I can't think of a place where again where I felt like my reasons for running for office clashed with yeah, I think if stuff is like, if it's a core values thing for you, I think, I, I think I speak for you guys when I say it's, the decision's pretty easy, right? right? Um, but the, I, I think the hardest bills to figure out how to vote on are the ones where you really don't really have, a, like the thing that I'm thinking of is the uh, fantasy sports stuff, yeah. which has been a huge issue in Springfield since I came in in 2015, and every lobbyist in Springfield is employed by one side or the other of this issue. Um, and it's just this like parochial turf battle between the brick and mortar casinos and the online fantasy sports interests of like who's gonna get what kind of turf in this like how are we gonna regulate? As I could not possibly care less. Like I mean, <laughs> this is on tape, so now I'm making a big show. <laughs> I just, it's just like, I mean, I'm sure that both sides have very compelling arguments and they've, they've been in my office a thousand times making them. Um, but like those are the ones where it's just like, how do you figure out which side to be on? Like, it, I, I don't think that, when I look at it through a prism of what are my values and like, what do I think the role of government should be in people's lives? Like government needs to, you know, play a role in intervening to protect people from abuses of, you know, corporate greed and those kinds of things. Like, it, it doesn't reveal anything to me about this issue. Like I look at it through that lens, and it's still totally muddy. So, uh, yeah, the bill hasn't come up for a vote yet, and I'm so glad because I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, one bill that I'm glad didn't come up for a vote mm -hmm. for us was the sugar tax. Uh huh. Because that that's was, an interesting example. I mean, yeah. So that's a, an example where you know, in terms of public policy, I understand and am very sympathetic to the public health goals mm -hmm. of a sugar tax type. Bill, right? But it was wildly unpopular, yeah. and yeah. in in my district, there were also lots of small businesses and you know lower income families that would have been hurt because it's a regressive tax. And um, so you know, I I really struggled with with that, and I'm you know kind of glad that we never really had to put on record. Yeah. You know. No, that's a good example of yeah, like two is. two different core values sort of clashing, right? Mm -hmm. Like on the one hand we're opposed to regressive taxation, and on the other hand, you know, the public health crisis that's being imposed on communities by these sugary beverages is really serious. And so like, the tension between those two values, that, I mean, yeah. and that happens often too, or not often, but every once in a while you come across. Does. And that's, that's really, I think, more, and those are better examples than, um, or good examples of that kind of, kind of tension that we feel. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a great question to close on because I think we spent the last quarter thinking a lot about models, <laughs> about how the equations of politics work, but the, real, the reality is that we are being represented by people. And so I love this very human, very interesting conversation. And let's uh, join me in thanking uh, Elaine. For the